This is Barbara Slave, and I'm at the Morris Institute Library in Natick, and I'm interviewing Lewis Kimball. And today is June 23rd, uh, 1998. I wanted to ask you, Mr. Kimball, if you don't mind me asking, uh, what is your age? Uh, 75. 75. And uh, your address? Natick. Natick. And your uh, current marital status? Married. Married. And how many children do you have? Three girls. And do you have any grandchildren? Uh, one grandson. Okay. M may I ask where you were born? Born in Framingham. You're born in Framingham. And were you raised in Framingham? I uh, went to school in Framingham. Okay. And they joined in Framingham. Yeah. Uh, the reason that I am in the UN in Natick, mm -hmm. because I, written, I married a Natick girl when I came back from the service, and my residence has been here in Natick ever since for the last 50 years or more. So around 50 years ago, what was Natick like? <laughs> That's a big question. A town like I wish it was right now. Uh, it was a country place. You know, yeah. it just began to grow. And then, the, of course, the housing development started and the development started. And, of course, they had problems with water and sewer and, you know, the regular things that the town had to look for. And, of course, that increased the school population in the schools. We've been having growing pains ever since, mm -hmm. the town. I hear people tell me about Natick in the old days having sheep and cows and whatever. Did, did, oh, do sure. you remember that? Yeah, you know, the area, you know, the, right here on uh, the, the North Main Street, there's a farm there that had cows and cattle up until three months ago. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, it, was, it, it was like a country town, really. Did and you say that, it? Uh, and this, the square down there, of course, had a the, the traffic box right in the middle of the square that you had to go around, you know, and then that was changed and then they had put one on the common, there was one on the common that they directed traffic from right in the center of town, and that's gone now. And of course, the traffic lights are here. Mm -hmm. Fifty years ago, well, how would people get about in cars, or how would they get about mostly? Uh, uh, the uh, buses were running then. Well, they had taken the railroad tracks up just before I moved to the, the uh, trolley cars. They used to go right up South Main, uh, Pond Street up into Framingham that way from Boston. And, uh, but they got around in cars and well, bicycles too. But they, uh, they got around all right. Stores were a lot different, of course. And mm -hmm. It was interesting. It, it just grew with it. It was, it was part of your life. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you're from Framingham. What was your family background? Uh, in what way? Uh, well, your parents. Uh, my parents, one was bought in, uh, born in Lancaster. Uh, you know, he was living in Lancaster. My mother was living in Bolton, Mass., and they, mm -hmm. they were married. And, and uh, when they were married, they moved down here to Framingham. Mm -hmm. And he was a power plant engineer, and he worked at the reformatory for women for 50 years. And so my residence was on the reformatory grounds for 23 years till they went into service. And it was Latin, again for a few months, a few. Uh, well, a year and a half more at that address until I got married and I moved down here to High Street in Natick after I got married. Did that give you, did growing up in a reformatory give you a different perspective on life than other kids, do you well, think? It was different. I mean, I mean we, we were so far away from the town. We were a mile and a half from the center of Framingham and we walked to school a mile and a half and thought nothing of it. Summer, winter, snow, ice and, and, and everything. And then and, and it was, we had uh, quite a rough time. We didn't know it at the time. but. Uh, of course, at the reformatory, they had a, it was complete. Then they had cattle and they had cows mm -hmm. and they had horses and they, they grew all the vegetables. And they made uh, at that time they made all the clothing for all the other reformatories around. And they, and they made flags there too for the state. So and, they, and during the summers they had a big canning process there at the reformatory. It was a huge canning process. They had great big steam mm -hmm. of uh, cooking things that they and lowered the baskets in and steamed them from the power plant. Right next to the power plant, they had the cannery so they could process the food and they send that to the other parts of the state. Wow. Um, could you tell me uh, how old you were when you joined the Air Force and how it happened? Uh, well, I know I spent my 21st birthday in Oxford, so it must have been 19, probably, 19. And uh, do you remember what year that was? Roughly 19, whatever. I haven't got a clue. That's whatever. okay. Well, that's okay. And how did you happen to choose the Air Force? Well, I, I went to Boston to, to enlist uh, in different areas. 
and I was rejected by four places, and, and, the, and the, fourth, the fifth place, said, the Air Force said they would take me in for some reason, which I was lucky to do, to get into the Air Force. So. Do you mind my asking why you were rejected? Do you know? I, I don't know. I really don't know. Hmm. It, uh, it, it, for, no, for no reason. And I, I couldn't explain why it was, yeah. and I'm thankful that it was at this time. Yeah. Did any of your friends or family join? Uh, my family, my brother joined the service, he was in the, in the Navy, and my, you, my sister Grace, she was in the uh, Navy too. Did you sign up before or after Pearl Harbor? Uh, the, the month of Pearl Harbor. They, they signed the month of Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I can remember uh, standing uh, at the airport flying model airplanes when came over the radio that Pearl Harbor was, uh, uh, you know, hit with the Japanese, you know, and... Uh, How did that news strike you? Well, you know that you know that, and uh, of course your parents don't want you to go to the service or anything, but of course, I, I, that's one thing that I never put my, paid much attention to. My parents, uh, they were three years with myself and my brother Everett and my sister Grace, all in the service, and not knowing where Everett was or I was, you know, can't write or anything like that. How, how do they feel for three years with three children in the service? When, uh, did you not write to them? Or? Very few letters got through. <clears throat> oh, Very okay. through. Very. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, you never think of what the parents were thinking. Mm. Oh, I'm a parent now and I know how to mm. think about it. Could you tell me where your basic training was? Uh, basic training. I never had any basic training. There's another <laughs> peculiarity in what I've done in, this, in my life in this service. Could you tell me when you first went overseas and what you did when you first went overseas, where you were? When I first went overseas, I landed, uh, we went over on a, on a USS Delta, a fruit ship, and uh, it was carrying uh, on the decks, it was carrying uh, locomotives for the British people and then down below it was full of tanks and we went through some pretty tough weather going over and it was one degree of bottom side up the rough water was so rough they said we would have gone over. So we pulled into Belfast Harbor and that was in the daytime and then the ship left Belfast Harbor and the next morning is the strangest thing. I woke up and I'm looking out my porthole and all I could see was a pasture and a cow looking at me. And I said to myself, this can't happen. And sure enough, we came down by the Isle of Man and we went into the River Severn, up towards Bristol, and up into Sharpness. And they had an unloading place there where they unloaded the uh, equipment that was on board the freighter. And uh, that's where I, I, I really stepped into English soil was on Bristol. <clears throat> and what did you do, what was your job for the Air Force when you were in Bristol? Well, when we got to Bristol, of course, that on board every ship, there was a whole bunch of our detachment, each detachment was sent out from Camp Kilmer the same way. And our ship, there was one unit, one detachment, there was detachment K, and there would be a, a weather van, there'd be another couple of vehicles and so forth. And they would be unloaded, and then we'd start, and then we'd be given or shown how to get to a place where we we're going to have a staging area, you know. And my job was to drive this six by six, which is a beauty because I was all enclosed. And I just remembered a, several months ago that couldn't find. I I never had any. I I drove the entire length of England, in the same way in France and into Germany. I I was always had a vehicle that I could drive myself. Mm. And it's very unusual for a serviceman to, you know, have your own private vehicle, really. Of course, I had a lot of responsibility. Other people rode with me, too. You know. So you, at that time, you were a driver? Or? No, I, see, I, and each one of us had to train to be a truck driver. Being right. air, that was part of the equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I qualified because I could drive it. In fact, I lot of, lost out on a good lot of trips because I, we're training a lot of these men back here in the States and they were driving around New England like crazy. And I didn't get to drive around because I knew how to drive. 
You mentioned before the interview you were a meteorologist. Were you a meteorologist at the time you were in Bristol? Yes. I, oh, I see. I, Ninety percent of my service I should be telling you about is in the United, in the United States, the different bases I was at, okay. and the thing how I got to be where I was, and the things I did. I never had a day of basic training in my life. So when you, what year was it when you were in Bristol then? In Bristol, England, what year? Was that 42, 43? Must have been 43. Okay. July of 43. Yeah. And from there, where did you go? We went, we were assigned to a base, uh, Air Force base in Swindon Common. And where is that? In the central lower part of England. Okay. I've got all kinds of maps here if you want to look yeah. at them. But yeah, after the interview, I'd love to. And w did you do the same type of work there? Well, always. When, once we got established, that was mm -hmm. our routine. What was your routine? What was your day like? From a t if there was a typical day, what would that be like? Uh, well, it, during the day, it, it would be uh, just routine. And uh, the communications telegraph people, in their, they had a van like I was, and they were, they were bringing in this, all this information on sheets of paper in columns of five, you know, all these numbers, and uh, by six o'clock at night or so, all that stuff would be ready. And then we would pick up that information and we open up our code books and take those numbers and subtract them from the numbers in the code book, which would be the code that we would be using for the meteorology maps, the like code for dew point, wind, direction, cloud cover, and so all that stuff was in code, and we had to put that code on, in symbols on our maps that we were working on. Mm -hmm. And that we'd be finished off about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning or something like that. So actually we worked eight hours, and you had the rest of the time off, but we were cleaning clothes and mm -hmm. doing our work and stuff like that. There was other things assigned to us that we could do. What did you like to do in your time off? Travel. Could I got a chance to go to Oxford, and I got the chance to go to different London, and I got the wow. chance to go to Ascot and stuff like that. And that's a whole new story that, that should be part of the adventure because this, well, I'm, this is not a typical war story. <laughs> it's a war story, but it's different from anybody you ever saw of you. Well, tell me something about going to Ascot or going to London. What, what sorts of things did you do there? Uh, well. Uh, we, we, we left that base, see, we never, see, we were always moving, so we left Swindon right. Common, we went to Colchester, mm -hmm. and uh, that was near the Clacton on the sea, and they'd be bombing that, the, British, the Germans would be bombing that place quite a lot. But anyway, I went from, uh, from uh, up there, it was, the Air Force was named, it was at Boxstead in, in uh, England, and uh, it was something that the unit that I was with wanted done in Ascot. So I was sent down to Ascot. I, you know, I took the vehicle and went down there and they provided a place to stay over because I was going to some place for information. And while I was at Ascot, that night the British, the uh, Germans came over with their aircraft and there was so much anti-aircraft over London that they didn't want to go back with a load of bombs so they came out over Ascot. And we knew that that plane was coming directly over us, and it did. Uh, it, it, you know, we went out of the barracks and jumped into trenches, and one bomb went off, the second bomb went off, the one that hit our base was a dud, and the other two went off. But I almost died in that tragedy, because <laughs> I jumped into a trench, and there was five guys on top of me, and I was in three inches of water trying to breathe, my face down. <laughs> I, almost, I couldn't get those guys out, they were scared of than I was. So they, I finally got off, and, and that was my experience at Ascot. And uh, it's just, it's just, things like that are happening to me all the time, mm -hmm. like that. And uh, we, uh, then I went to uh, Maidstone mm -hmm. Air Base, they sh keep, kept shipping us east. As we as the war went on, there was, mm -hmm. we were getting more and more acquainted, and our planes were flying uh, support groups for the B-19s. B-17s were coming off from northern England 
in Scotland. And they would, uh, these B-17s would go over our, over our base about five o'clock in the morning. And then our pilots would take off about an hour and a half later and escort them over to Germany. What was it like um, waiting for the planes to come back from, let's say, bombing missions? It was kind of tough. There's some of those airplanes, B-17s, they'd come back and then land at any base they could. And uh, it was a tragedy lots of times because the people, they would land and uh, the only thing you could do was take a fire hose or something to wash the guys out of the bay, bay turrets or the tail gunner's turret and wash them out and clean the place up and let the planes fly back. Some of the planes wouldn't make it, they'd be in the field and mm -hmm. the, the crew would be all right, but the planes would be gone. Did and you some of our pilots coming back, they would fly such long time. One plane came back uh, and he landed and he on the runway and he rolled right up almost to the, uh, the lines the other way we were supposed to stop. He ran out of gas and it was all right. The next fellow landed. He didn't have any brakes. He kept right on going. He went right up on top of the other fellow and killed him right on the plane. The guy wasn't there. 15 seconds before he's killed at his own base. Mm -hmm. These are the tragedies I'm trying to tell people around that you, you don't hear of. And some of the young men, you were young, you'd be surprised in the year and a half, two years, they'd, you'd think they're old men. They would, you know, they went, went, four men, four of the pilots took off one night and they went to town and coming back, there was, something happened to the Jeep or something, they were all killed. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's those things you don't hear of. And, uh, Did you get to know the pilots? Oh, yeah, sure. You, I, I didn't get to know the pilots that well because, you see, I was confined to my area and the cook and the quartermaster cook people and the engineers another group and you stayed put. Uh, we lost our commanding officer. Of the, 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 he was flying and he met a German head on and he, they were playing chicken. They had hit each other head on in the aircraft. He bailed out, and that was a miracle because eight weeks later, he showed up at the base. Where was he? We can, um, would you like to stop the tape for a little while? He, uh, he was shot down, he parachuted out, and the French underground cut him out and oh. brought him back. Uh, when it, but you know, see, I, I wasn't in danger of myself too much, but it was these other things that I right. observed. You um, mentioned also you went to France. Is that something you yeah, like to talk uh, about? We, each time I went to Maidstone from uh, from uh, Boxted, we we set up the camp there again. We set up yeah. the whole uh, quadrant and it acted, completely acted. We were really war ready at that time. Mm. And we didn't know at that time that we were ready to go. And uh, the uh, air base that we were at was in southern England. It's quite a big air force base for uh, England. When the, when it was right in the uh, range where people, they could get bombed if they wanted to spring mm. in there. But we were ready in the next uh, week. I say we, the pilots are always flying. They're always, you know, going over and back. And, yeah, of course, we lose planes. We get new planes and new pilots. And, but we told, all of a sudden we were told to, uh, to get ready. And uh, of course, we, that, that morning, we would notice we were near enough, that we, there was all these planes flying. Early in the morning, I was flying over and going over to Germany, but there were planes, uh, DC-3s pulling uh, gliders, and in the gliders would be infantrymen and stuff, and they'd pull them over and they would cut them loose and they'd land in France over there and nothing but slaughter over there. And they, so that we knew then that the war had started. We knew, we knew before anybody, the planes were going over. So anyway, we're ready to go. The next thing we told, they, we got all ready to go. And another, another thing that makes me laugh is we were all in 
in the convoy. And we went down towards uh, London and went through London and of course we got to go under the, under the Thames River. All our equipment's got to, you know, that, and it's, uh, it's a small subway, a tunnel under there that I didn't think the truck was going to make it. So what do I, we meet the first thing we come was one of these big English two decker red buses coming through mm -hmm. and I got my big truck and I think we swapped paint in there, <laughs> but <laughs> we got through and uh, we went down to the uh, Isle of Man in that area. And uh, on the way down, you take an area like from Gloucester, Mass, down to Cape Cod, and you line those uh, those streets up all the way down, every side road, every field, every, everything there for 30, 40, 60 miles was nothing but trucks, plane, uh, tanks, equipment, everything you could think of, all ready to go, miles and miles and miles. Mm -hmm. And we went, kept right on going down through, right down to the dock there. And uh, this is crazy, because this is Air Force, and there were three days, uh, you know, the invasion, and here we were three days, we were getting ready to go across. They put us on these landing crafts that, you know, you drive on, and when the front goes down, and you right draw away, you see them in the movies. Well, we were all ready to go, and we went across that night. And we got over there, and of course the, the beaches were horrible. You couldn't get on the beach if you wanted to. But they, before, that's right too. I was, we, we all had our positions, and I was the first one in line. And all of a sudden they called us, the four landing craft they had, they called us back. They moved us back to the back of the boat and put two Canadian tanks on each one in front so that they would be before, be before us. Could you tell me just where you were at this point when you say the beaches? Is this Normandy or where are you talking about right now, the beaches? Right, Normandy Beach. Normandy, okay. We're headed for Normandy Beach. Right. And uh, so we, we got over there and the first thing, you know, you, you, because another thing I'd like to tell you about all your all the preparation you have to do to get this ready to go. Mm -hmm. You know, the waterproofing your trucks and everything, I can tell you later. but. Our trucks and everything were ready to go. Right, you have to drive right into the water. Command was the, the, the front goes down. You go off. Just in the, you're off by the time that hits the ground. So that's what happened. Those two tanks went right off. One boom, right like the other. We never saw them again. We hit a sandbar, and one went right in on top of the other. These Canadian tanks didn't make any difference. Those guys were lost, dead. We backed off, and we put another, come into another area where it was more shallow. We had all week, and we got off and got off the beach. But all you can do because of the debris, you know, it was trucks and everything you can think of that didn't get started again. Where, and they had these great big tanks with a humongous big blade, bulldozer blade on it. And it didn't make any difference whether it was running, stuck, dead, or alive. He was just clearing the beach back and forth like this, and there's piles of bodies and piles of trucks and piles of equipment. And he just keep that open because everything had to go in. It had to, had to, it, you, if you stop, you get pushed off. But everything had to keep going up that beach because it was such a, you know, it, it was a priority to get up. Uh, so we survived that. It's a strange thing. So you were part of the invasion then? Well, or two the days, two and a half days later or something. Yeah. Well, the Air Force, they, everybody on the beach was cursing us because we were the Air Force. <laughs> they weren't any, any, wasn't any use to them at that time. But mm. what they were doing was to get the uh, fighter base on that side as quickly as possible mm. so that it could be operation and to help the rest of the people come in. So once you got to France, what did you do then? What we are responsible for. Well, that's a funny thing, too. When, when they couldn't find a place for us, so they pushed it over, us off to the side for a while to get all our equipment over in this big field next to the woods or something. Well, we didn't realize that in the woods there's, there's this huge artillery battery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, air, the aircraft was coming over, and they started shooting and scared the heck out of us because we went well, like from here to the church from where they were shooting. They, they, our, uh, American artillery, and uh, that gave us quite an awakening on what was going on at the beaches over there. And uh, I think it was the next morning, 
uh, that, that, late that night, the German planes came over with sea mines. You know, they, they wanted to drop into the, the channel to get rid of the ships out there. Well, the, the anti-aircraft was so thick that the Germans' planes come in, and before going back, of course, they want to get rid of their sea mines. And I know they must be humongous mines, because when that hit the ground, it blew a hole in there that you could bury this building in. And the effect on some of the trucks there, there was uh, at least drop center rims, and the uh, pressure that's in the tire was overcome by the pressure of that bomb, and it sent all the grass and all the twigs and stuff up against that rim and made a complete wreath of all four wheels. There was so much pressure, it was just debris. And the trucks, panel trucks, they had panel trucks that have equipment in them and they had drawers inside the trucks that you could use and like that. And the, uh, the, the uh, implosion that created such a vacuum, it tore every one of those units right off the wall Every, every drawer in that place and dumped it on the floor. Just just a shockwave of this. So those are the things that I, you know, I'm seeing. It's just, you don't observe these things too much, you know. It's funny, before the interview, you mentioned that you weren't in combat, but it sounds like you, you were at risk and you we saw a lot of action. Close, yeah. You just weren't a combat soldier, but mm. you were definitely in the yeah. thick of the battle, it sounds to me. And uh, when we started to move, you know, you, you go through we went from there to Saint Désir in France. That's the base that we sneered the town. We had a. See, now, we became a portable air base. Uh, we had engineers there that would uh, pick an uh, orchard or something like that, and they would put these metal pl plates down all through the orchards and all across the fields and everything so that we could get our planes in the, underneath there. And uh, the, it would, the, where were the planes flying to? Hmm? The planes that you had in France at the Portable Air Base, what were they doing? Were they doing bombing missions in Germany? They, it was, they were supporting the forward troops. And the where, forward yeah, troops. Yes, they were call, yeah. And uh, the, uh, where was I? That's, uh, Port, portable Air Base. And it, we uh, we brought that base up so that we were almost permanent there then because we had this foundation and of course the, the probably other units were coming in but we were there so permanently that we stayed right through the winter in France there in that, in that little village and uh, I can still we were in three feet of snow in, in seven man tents. And, it was pretty tough for that winter. Could you name the town again? I'm sorry. Saint Désir. So, pardon me. Saint Désir. Saint Désir. Yes, I can. Okay. French. How were your living conditions? You say you were in a seven-man tent. Well, we had car, we had potbelly stoves, and we had winter clothes. And we, had, and we we made the most of it. it uh, and of course, we, yeah, everything your meals were cooked outside. They'd be cooked, they, People, the, the quartermaster, I guess what they call them. That, that, that was a detachment. Everything was in space with a detachment. They fed us. And I can remember out in the cold there, they had the uh, GI cans, the big galvanized trash cans, like they had them full of hot water. They had these gas things under it, and that's the only way you could wash your mess kits and stuff, is dip them into that thing like that. And uh, it didn't make any difference. If, if you were in line to get your breakfast, you went first. If the colonel was back there, tough. He waited. Nobody, no rank, no nothing. Wow. And uh, I can still, in the summertime, in the springtime, I can still see these French villages. The strange thing is they had a, uh, their farms and everything, and they piled the manure out in the street, right in the street. They piled these huge piles of manure in the street. And for what reason, I don't know. I suppose maybe the age so they could get into the into the ground in the springtime. Mm -hmm. But the most potent thing that you could smell was every Tuesday and Thursday, you could smell the bakeries, the oh. bakeries, and uh, the smell of bread all over town. And then you'd see the men going out, and you've heard the phrase, a jug of wine, a piece of bread and a jug of wine or something. They'd go out with a jug of wine and a loaf of bread, and they'd go out to eat, and he'd, he'd eat and he'd just 
take a jackknife, take a piece of bread and eat it on the way. Mm. And uh, that's the way they lived. And I don't know how those French people put up with it, but they were, they were great people. Did you get to interact with any no, French you people? You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't, you didn't leave the base. You didn't, you, you, you were ready for any time to move. Where did you go from there? Well, I'm trying to think. I know that the Battle of St. Lo in France was on, uh, oh yeah, that's right too. Uh, and uh, that was a central point between Cherbourg Peninsula and the Brest Peninsula, you know, if you know the Dregard geography of France. And uh, they started in the morning and they were still going in the afternoon. And I can still remember the bombers coming in from England and they, at that time they were dropping uh, the, sh the chaff, they call it, you know, it, it's uh, aluminum foil mm -hmm. from the aircraft. And uh, they were making contrails too. And there were so many of them, they did it so long that it actually rained at three o'clock in the afternoon because of the, they changed the weather pattern. And uh, could you tell me what the purpose of the aluminum foil was? Yeah, that was to distort the radar. German radar. German, German radar. That would drive it crazy because right. all that chaff falling in the air and blowing around. And by the time they figured out where it was, it was too late, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and anyway, they were given orders to bomb this St. Lowe because it's a major axis of where the Germans could go back and forth. And and there was another tragedy there. They, 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 told, them, they, they told them to bomb the city and, and to, you see, the, the, the later, a uh, lot of groups to come in and to bomb on the smoke, you know, because that's where the fire was, how uh, the thing was. But, you know, smoke travels. Mm -hmm. And the tragedy was they bombed on the smoke and they bombed 99% of our soldiers. Oh. By bombing on the smoke, uh could you explain that to me? Why would we bomb on the smoke? Well, what does that, that mean? See, that, would, that, would be, that would be their target. You see the town burning, see? Mm -hmm. and, and they tell them, you know, that's where it was. You bomb on the, right. the smoke. The fellows that came in an hour and a half later, they were bombing on the smoke. They, right. It was a couple of miles the other way. They didn't know which end was which. So that, that was a tragedy, mm -hmm. too. That was, you know, they were, well, anyway, we went through there two days later, I guess it was, and that city was still dust, it's dust as high as the church. And we were headed for the uh, Brest Peninsula, and we went out there. I can't think of the name of the town, but I can do remember it was a hot, hot day, and our whole convoy was going out there. And we got about halfway out there, and there was a blockade. It was all the French people. <coughs> They had blocked the entire road, the French civilians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they stopped us, brought out uh, all kinds of bread, uh -huh. wine. Uh -huh. You wouldn't believe the bottles were so dusty <laughs> and uh, cobwebby. And we had a ball. And the, uh, <laughs> that's, the hornets like, you know, honey and I like the smell. <laughs> the hornets came around there and everything. But these people were so generous and so good, they didn't want us to leave. Oh. And we were really late yeah. getting through there. And uh, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was something to see these people to do that. Yeah. And we took over an air base out there that the Germans had. They left it so fast that they had, they had everything left yeah. there. They even had model airplanes of our, our equipment, our planes and stuff, all in it. Jack there and everything, and we we had a very pleasant time at that time. When now you said, hey, when, when did we visit things?" Well, I went to you know where Mont Saint Michel is there in, in France, the the, the, uh, the cathedral out there. It's a very mm -hmm. famous one. Yeah. Well, we were close enough so we could get there, and we could drive on the beach at a low tide. Yeah. So we drove our trucks out to the Mont Saint Michel Cathedral there. We took a walking tour all the way up through the building and down again and to see that. And this, mm -hmm. you see, it's a, you wouldn't think this is war, but there's so many other things I could tell you about. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened next? We, uh, oh, we got, then we, uh, the war got so that we could go across France. And we were 
told to leave there and go to Metz, and that's on the borderline of Germany and France. Metz, did you say? M-E-T-Z, is it? Okay. And uh, so in driving back, we had to go through Paris, uh, and for some reason, we had to stop in Paris for something. So I got to see the cathedral there, and uh -huh. I got to see the Arc de Triomphe. In fact, I drove right through it. What year would you say that was? 1940, 44? Mm -hmm. And, uh, let's see, we, no, that's right too, we didn't go, we went to Reims first, we went to Reims, Reims. first. Okay. And that's the champagne capital of the world. Right. And that is such a gorgeous place. Mm -hmm. We had a chance to see that. It's uh, underground, it's in limestone, thing, nine miles of corridors, and it, it, each, it has each uh, uh, area had, uh, like America, South America, and England, and Germany, they all had, and then avenues, like Pennsylvania, and New York Avenue, mm -hmm. and uh, off of them, and all the carvings in the wall and everything, and all they did is have champagne. They would men <laughs> down, they lived their life, and they, they were turning bottles all the time. Uh -huh. The air was beautiful down in there, and, and uh, see, th th this is war. <laughs> right. Well, we we brought some champagne back to the base, and that was my downfall, I guess. Because <laughs> I had a day off, <laughs> and I, I can't remember two days. It was kind of cold, and I was it was really comfortable. I, was, I just got through work, and I was sitting down, and I was reading, and drinking champagne by the mess cup full. Well, we didn't drink it by the mess cup full and stand up. <laughs> <laughs> that was two days gone, and they said that I had got dressed in my sergeant's uh, uniform while head of the town. It took about four guys to get me back in. But those are the stupid things you do. Uh, but uh, it, uh, I was, you know, in, in, in that situation, I was still, I was made sergeant quite early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which was, you know, it's. Uh, well, what, since you mentioned your rank, could you just, from the beginning to the end of your career, of the war, could you tell me what your rank was when you signed up? You were private first class. Private first oh, class. No, private, just private. Right. And then first class, and then corporal, mm -hmm. and then sergeant. Corporal and sergeant. Okay. And uh, in the service, you don't go, you don't advance that fast. Right. And uh, come to find out, that was my sister. She, you interviewed her, did you? No, I did not, but I think but, someone my else sister, might have. I never yeah. knew what she did in the service, and nobody knew what she did yeah. in the service. And she could never leave her place. There had to be two people with her, and there was always somebody watching them. And you couldn't write, she couldn't do anything. And come to find out, she was in the cryptography section oh. in Washington, D.C. Wow. And they were working on code. Yeah. And it was her group that cracked the Japanese code. Oh, wonderful. That made all the difference. But I was thinking, maybe I was talking about rank. You don't make first class petty officer in the Navy mm. in two years. Right. You mentioned, uh, I heard you were also in Germany. Could you tell me? Yeah, we left, we left that's right, we left Reims and we went to uh, Metz. That's where we, that's, and we went through, through Metz. Mm -hmm. And we kept going into Ansbach. I think it's Ansbach, Germany. Mm -hmm. And that's like the Air Force base that we have out in Colorado. Mm -hmm. It's a great, beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. uh, area of buildings. And you know, look, look like an old-time college with brick buildings and stuff. It's one of the major Air Force bases in Germany. And uh, we were stationed there permanently until the end of the war. And uh, while we were there, the, the war was declared over. And the uh, air bases around, especially ours, put out the uh, notice to German, all new Germans and flyers and so forth, that they wanted to surrender to our base, that we would take them in. Mm -hmm. And we got the biggest conglomeration of aircraft you ever saw, from big things to small, th you know, great big airplanes, and all kinds of pilots came in and surrendered their airplanes there yeah. at the- Were uh, there any high ranking? Pilots who came in? Well, I, I couldn't see any. I mean, yeah. they, everything is done in hush hush, different areas. You know, right. they just, you don't let too many people know what's going on. So, but, 
uh, did you, uh, the United States Air Force, at some point, I think they started collaborating with the RAF. Were you, did you, were you part of that collaboration? No, no I, I wasn't aware of that at all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And were you aware of uh, um, the changes in the bombing patterns? Apparently, we became more aggressive in our bombing See, of Germany. I, we were isolated, like any group. Right. You, you don't know any more than you, they let the, you, mm. you know. Of course, you, you don't know. Yeah. You don't know the other, other military people would know all of that. And I know while we were at the Ansbach, we were waiting for the uh, war to end, and we were there, and uh, we, uh, down back of the air base, there was a railroad siding there, and they had a freight cars on it. One freight car was loaded with motorcycles. So you can bet your boots every man has had a motorcycle on that base within 20 <laughs> minutes. And of course, there was no flying at that time. We were just waiting. So the runways made a great place to learn how to drive motorcycles. Where were you when you heard that the war was really over? Uh, I was there. Yeah. And, you know, it, you know, went through Frankfurt up to Ansbach. Yeah. We were there at the end of the war. Yeah. And how was do you, how how did you hear it and how did you feel? Uh, and we heard it over the radio. Yeah. And uh, it came over, and that was another thing. Uh, you know, pilots have communications with other pilots and so forth like that, and other air bases. And of course, we we're a fighter base. But all of a sudden, we ended up with one of these Army Transport DC-3 mm -hmm. air, airplanes. For what reason, I don't know. And next thing we know, the, the commander and the, and the uh, vice commander of the air base, they had gone, gone off with that airplane. Well, they were gone for about five days, and that plane came back. And they had the biggest collection of whiskey and wines and beers that you could ever think of. <laughs> and we had a party. <laughs> it, was, it was nice of these guys. I, I won't tell you who did it, but a couple of the top people riding around on weapons carriers with just T-shirts and dungarees on and shooting rifles. And <laughs> 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 oh, it, it, see, it's, it's a different it's a tragedy in this. But, uh, the tragedies was you go into one of these fields to set up an air base and you'd find corpses around there that hadn't been found for two or three weeks or mm -hmm. months and you'd have to clean them they're all you know, deteriorated and, and and a lot of things you know we would we uh we had to get get out of the way of a tank and somebody was trying to move a tank with the German tank and we went up and looked in it and you couldn't see anything but Parts of bodies all blown mm -hmm. apart and things like that. And then there's a, another thing we were following a, ta a, a tank through a French town one time, and it was just barely making it through those narrow streets. I think the, the tread was up on the sidewalk on both sides. And he'd come to a corner and he knew that he shifted his direction, he was going to hit the wall. Well, when you have a tank, you got to turn. You start up, and the bricks from the sidewalks were all flying. The sides of the walls of the building were covered off, and he just kept on going. It's, it, I, I, that's what I'm trying to say. Is all of this stuff is different. It's not. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, oh wait a minute, yeah, I got way ahead of myself too. It's okay. Well, what what happened after the war ended? Where, where did okay, you go? Okay, just be prior to the the uh, war end, the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. Now, we were issued M uh, carbine rifles way back in, in uh, Camp Kilmer in New Jersey. Now, to this day, I don't know whether I got any ammunition with mine or not. <laughs> I put the gun somewhere, and then you know, during the Battle of the Bulge, it was the middle of the winter, uh -huh. and it was snow up to your elbows. It was, I don't know how that day did it. And we got, the, we got the notice that every man on the base would get a gun and go out and stand guard duty. Well, to this day, I don't know whether I picked the gun up and I heard they had any ammunition or not, but I know I stood in that snow for hours on end. And you're supposed to challenge people going through the password. Hmm. Well, there's truckloads of men going this way. You didn't know whether they're Germans or American uniforms, you know. 
and you don't challenge anybody. You don't know the password. You just stand there like a dummy, and these <laughs> things are going by, you know, and uh, we didn't know what was going on. You know, because what, you know, and what they were trying to do, I guess, is because they had no idea they had overrun us, and, but we didn't know whether they were dressed as Americans or whether mm -hmm. our trucks or not. So I stood there like a dummy, and I was just like going by down in that. The traffic just went by us in the middle of the night constantly. During the, the snow was terrible, and uh, it, uh, no passwords, no nothing. Was thought, there much infiltration by Germans? Not, not in our areas. Just, just around, you know, whether. Well, you can't tell. You know, you know, they dress like you are, right. but that's getting off the track. But there's so much stuff to tell. Well, anyway, the war was over, and uh, the uh, word came through that there was a, one of these uh, transport units going to fly back to America. <laughs> and uh, they wanted to know if anybody wanted to go. Of course, they're dummies. Everybody wanted to go. And uh, so we had, they gave us our uh, records or whatever, they, you know, you have the records of your shots and your Everything was in an envelope, mm -hmm. whether you had shots for this and that and for the tropics and so <clears throat> So four or five, we all got in line and four or five, and then we were getting disqualified, disqualified, and we finally found out why. Come to find out they didn't have their uh, shots for tropical fevers and that sort of thing. And we found out where it was you know, on the sheets of paper. Well, we just expertly opened our papers and we initialed in a date about uh, nine months earlier than that that we had our shots and everything and put down somebody's initials and sealed it up. <laughs> okay, you can go, you can go. <laughs> so they put us on, uh, there was 21 planes going back. And we, uh, let's see, we got, uh, on the, oh yeah, they, we flew into France, uh, the, the, uh, in the Paris. And, uh, we got gas and something, and then we flew down to Le Havre, down in southern France. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, they evidently had the air base there, they had, we refueled. We went over to uh, Marrakesh uh, in Morocco. Mm -hmm. We landed over there in Africa, and they, of course they got resupplied there. And then we made a long flight down to uh, Dekar in Senegal, in Africa. Mm -hmm. And that took us over the Sahara Desert. Wow. And they, uh, we were at 8,000 feet, and the, the wind was blowing. It was sand at that height, blowing in the in One airplane engine, the one of the, the, the crash landed in the desert. We don't know what happened to them. But it was complete desert, mm -hmm. on account of the sand, you know. Mm -hmm. And our problem was that the air was so light that we couldn't get any lift on our aircraft. And between the Sahara and the other part of the jungles on Africa was a mountain range that was 8,000 feet high. And we couldn't get higher than about 7,500. And we got kind of worried and worried. And we looked ahead, and I don't know how the pilots did it. I mean, they didn't. We, we, there was a big mountain range of stone. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we went, there was a gully in it, and we went right straight through that gully about five feet off the top of that mountain. Oh. And we landed down in Deca. And from there on, I don't know what the heck, they, we gassed up, and we went down. We flew to the uh, Ascension Island in the South Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And that's an island five by seven, it's owned by Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, the 2,500, there's one hill on it, the rest of it's desert. And they had organic gardens on there and everything so they could have food and stuff. And uh, when you landed on this volcanic runway, it was about uh, 200 feet up in the, and they had leveled it off so you could go straight in and you kind of go up around it. You get top of the volcano-like activity and park your airplane. So when you took off, you're all and you come back down, it took off, you're 200 feet in the air already. And uh, there was 21 of us, and we flew into us. From there, we flew into Natal in Brazil, and then into Belém, 
And was and, this all by way of just going home? Yeah. <laughs> and our airplane, we had a navigator, and uh, they told us never, don't, under any conditions, fly over Brazil, fly along the coast. Well, knowing these hotshot pilots, everybody followed our navigator. We got over the central part of Brazil, more than the central part, and there was already 21 planes down there with 10 men on board that they'd never found in the, in the Brazil, in the jungle. Oh. It's so thick. And they said the casualties, they're on the way home. Oh. 10 big oh. planes. Our engine started to buckle and buckle and jump like that, and they told us to throw everything overboard. Well, of course, you don't want to throw everything overboard. You got all these souvenirs, you got to save them, but over they went. And they finally told us to jump. We said, no way. You know, live or die, you're going to go die one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Finally, we got close to French Guiana, and there was a communications group there of some kind, and there was a long enough strip so our airplane could just get in. Mm -hmm. We got in there and we landed, and uh, I think uh, we got out all right, and we put the plane, the plane, we pushed it off the runway, and we just sat there in about eight hours. There's a plane came in from British Guyana, I think it was, and it was an eight passenger plane, so there was five of us and two pilots of seven. We got on that light plane and we took the plane and, well, before the plane and pulled it clear up into the woods as far as it could go, tail first. We got in there and, and, he, and he revved the motors up to maximum speed, just as fast as mm -hmm. he could get it. And we took off and we took two feet off the tree down the end of the runway. And we went into Dutch Guiana, and uh, they, uh, and that, that's the funny thing too. There was an American base there, and uh, we got off the plane. Everything. And we only thing we had on was our, our uh, coveralls. We were flying. Everything else was packed, and uh, so I, I headed for the PX. You know. What, nothing else to do. And uh, so I'm walking across the PX, next thing I know, a couple of MPs grabbed me and I was thrown in jail for five hours. <laughs> what for? Out of uniform. <laughs> See, it's stupidity. <laughs> so, I don't know. So how did you finally wind your way home well, from there? From there, some plane picked us up. We went to Puerto Rico, fueled up there, and then we went to Miami landed there, and uh, then we came to Fort Devens by mm -hmm. train. Can you tell me what your homecoming was like? <laughs> I, I called my folks from Fort Devens to get me, pick me up, because we had no transportation from Dennis, from uh, Fort Devens at that time. And they missed me. They went right by me. They didn't stop to come back again, so they didn't pick me up. So I called my cousin that lived in Shirley up there, and he, they picked me up and took me home. And it was no big deal. <laughs> Nothing. I got home, and uh, my orders were to uh, report. That's the first furlough I had in three years. Mm -hmm. I never had a furlough. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of days off. And I, and I was what the Greensboro, North South Carolina, for overseas duty in the Pacific. And they're supposed to be there a specific time. That night, I was out walking with some friends of ours in the neighborhood, and a girl, there was five of us, I think, and we were walking along the street around my house there, right, right around the reformatory. And uh, next thing I know, I look around, and this car's coming down the road. I, just as I turned, I got hit with a car. My wristwatch took the radiator cap off. My shoulder took the radiator and grilled into the radiator. My legs bent the bumper in and threw me 65 feet down the road, sliding on my back. And I had a broken leg. And uh, I wasn't home seven hours when I was put in Cushing Hospital. Mm -hmm. The funny part of it was the guys had come out to pick me up. They grabbed me by the arms and the legs was going to throw me in a stretcher. These guys didn't know anything about first aid. I had oh. to yell at them, tell them that my leg was broken. Mm. 
And uh, so I spent, uh, I think there's a picture, no, uh, July, I get, August, September, October, and I didn't get discharged until December. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, my world record is spoiled because I'm AWOL, I'm wanted as a fugitive. Oh. They are sent out all from MPs and wants <laughs> for me. They called the hospital and they wouldn't believe them. And they're so stupid, they sent four men all the way up from Greensboro, Carolina to pick me up and take me back. Mm -hmm. They found me still in the hospital and they finally believed it. Uh -huh. So when I, I lost, uh, let's see, I had, well, I can't remember now. I, I, I gained three, about three different uniforms and the whole, mm -hmm. I had three outfits. But they shipped me from, from uh, Cushing Hospital to, to Fort Devens, and that was, <laughs> that was another thing. I headed for the PX and everything like that, and within two hours, they were calling for me. All the other guys had gone home and they missed me, so I had to come home the third day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's only a synopsis. I yeah. mean, there's a lot of things I like to tell you about preparation in, in, that I had during the United States, the different air bases I was on, and some of the tragedies that were there. Mm -hmm. uh, Could you tell me how serving in the Air Force in World War II affected the rest of your life? Or? It kind of matured me. I mean, mm -hmm. you learn how to get along. You learn mm -hmm. how to cope, you, you uh, accepted things, you, you, you know, when you first go in, you just kind of resent it, uh, you get acclimated, really, and uh, I, you know, considering what I had to go through, I mean, it, it was nothing to what I ever thought of, but in, infantry men, I don't know, and, and those people in the front lines, mm -hmm. it's, I just can't imagine what, this was a totally different experience, the war experience from anybody else. Mm -hmm. Is there any thought or memory that you'd like to share for posterity with your, the community about World War II and about your experience? I don't think there was. Mm -hmm. uh, no. <clears throat> well, I want to thank you for spending this time with me and allowing uh, us to interview you. It's been delightful for someone who um, doesn't have uh, so-called combat experience, you've seen a lot of action, and I want to thank you for spending this time with me. Thanks I very much. I started out by making model airplanes, and that's how we were, as kids, we were all making airplanes. Yeah. And I've got a picture in here oh, of, a, good. of a sailplane that I just decided I'd, on a piece of brown paper that I would make it and design it and fly it. I'd like to tell you about that good. sometime. But, and uh, we can we can meet again, um, and we can mm -hmm. look at this material after uh, the interview's over. I but did uh, spend all my GI money on flying lessons. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a lesson. My lessons. I, I yeah. flew different, three, four different kinds of aircraft. And I did go to Portland. I've been to yeah. Portsmouth. I've been to Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, Worcester, Nashua, New Hampshire. But I uh, alone in the, mm -hmm. So uh, when I got through with my, you couldn't in those days you could, couldn't afford to fly. In those days you didn't have any. Mm -hmm. When I did get through, look for a job, fifty cents an hour. That's what I started with. Wow. And uh, I worked for right here at Natick, mm -hmm. and Warren Machine Works down here. They did mm -hmm. all kinds of machine work, uh, uh, repair work, for all well, different factories around there. We made equipment like that and so forth. And, so I learned that, and I got a chance to go to Denison, mm -hmm. and uh, as a machinist, at 55 cents an hour, big deal. Yeah. And I went in there, and, and the men I worked with were great men, they were older fellas, and of course I was green behind the ears as far as factory maintenance, mm -hmm. stuff, and they saw me through it, you know, different, like helping them, I picked up the trade, and uh, I did all kinds of machine work and maintenance work, and I finally ended up as an experimental machinist. I had to learn the machine trade, all the trade. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, uh, from there, uh, we were making equipment and machinery to, to, to decorate containers and bottles were at Denison. And uh, they, I, they sent me out as a factory rep, just installing all this equipment all over the United States. 
in the Continental Can, American Can, and Fabergé and all that sort of thing. Fabergé, I like to tell you about that plant sometime. Mm -hmm. And uh, in California for months at a time. I really didn't see my, I, I would be in and out of the airport maybe five times in one month. Mm -hmm. And that'd be three days here. That evening. One day I was, we got a call here in Massachusetts to go out to American Can Company out in San Francisco. And uh, they were having a trouble with their equipment. They were losing $1,500 a minute. Mm -hmm. And this call came in at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We were on a plane at 5. We were out in San Francisco five hours later, whenever it was. And, and uh, that's right, it was uh, New Year's Day, New Year's weekend. Mm -hmm. And I went to work at 2 o'clock in the morning out there and worked until 3 o'clock in the afternoon and got them going. And it was like that. We had to do all kinds of things like that. And I don't think I see my family. You know, I'd be gone for weeks at a time sometimes. Mm -hmm. I went with a fuller out to Los Angeles. We went, had a problem with a factory out there. We were just setting up new, new equipment and everything. And, um, it was so hot that you wouldn't believe down there in Houston. And uh, it sounds as though you were more than a machinist. What what were you a some sort of troubleshooter? Troubleshooter, yeah, trouble factory rep troubleshooter. Right. And, yeah, and uh, so that's what I did afterwards. And I had a lot of I'd, I'd have been, I'd be in, uh, and then they had a system where you'd be visiting one factory this day and another one that day, and then I'd fly to, to uh, Cincinnati. One day I'd be in Columbus, and then I'd be in uh, Cleveland another day, and then another day I'd be in Houston, and then another day I'd be in uh, Fort Worth. That means a car, a plane, wow. another car, another hotel. <laughs> uh, so I've had a busy life. Yeah, I, 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 I appreciate Denison for giving me a chance. Yeah. When I, when I uh, left, the, uh, left Denison, I was making Fourteen dollars an hour at that time, and all benefits paid. Right. But uh, there's a lot of things that I'd like to talk to you about. Sure, okay. I'd love to talk to you about. Yeah. It. Well, but at this point, uh, what I'd like to do is close up this interview, mm -hmm. and then we can meet again uh, to discuss other aspects of the war and what else, you, or other things you've done. But um, I am going to close the interview now, and I want to thank you so much. It's been so exciting. It's been a real roller coaster ride. <laughs> yeah. So we'll close it up now, and I, I want to thank you so much. Yeah, I, I, I look forward to this. I thank really you. Do. I so did yeah. I. Yeah.